I'm Josh Cooperman, and this is Comfort by Design with an episode featuring a spectacular creative. Adam Hunter and I met a long time ago. Um, he's amazing. And I'm just going to go ahead and call it. I'm going to call the following episode an instant classic. And I don't do that often. And you're going to hear why. <laughs> As mentioned, Adam and I first met years ago at an industry function in LA. I have followed his career and it literally has been incredible to see what he's done with his firm. He's built an amazing firm upon truly spectacular design and an affinity for drama going back to his previous career in theater. We, we talk about this and a, a number of other things that correspond to the work he's done, which, per usual for the show, we explore and evaluate online. And if you wish to follow along as we do this during our conversation, which I highly encourage you to do because it is both fun and fascinating to see how the work, as we describe it, in real time. It, it's basically, it's an insider's look at design. Go to adamhunter.com, check the projects as we talk through these. You're going to love it, I promise. When evaluating the work of a creative like Adam Hunter, it is enlightening to understand that Adam built a successful career in theater prior to coming into design. That experience can be seen in the narrative that the design tells. It's a form of storytelling, both from an understanding of, of whom he's designing the space and the lives of those who inhabit the space, how they want to live. I, I've had a number of, of wonderful conversations over the years with professional uh, set decorators, and it's truly amazing to hear how they process a, a written script. And then dress a set to provide details of the character that neither the actors nor the script itself could possibly explain. It provides nuance and context. A performer like Adam both understands this and has been trained to both ideate and execute on the concept, which, when done right, when done correctly, tells the story of the characters and defines who they are by how they live. And you're going to hear Adam talk us through it right after this. I am just incredibly proud of this partnership I've got with Thermosol. They have been presenting partners of Convo by Design going on five years now. And there is a certain amount of pride that comes with saying that the show is presented by the company that is the best in the world at what they do. Thermosol engineers the most exceptional smart shower products and steam shower systems worldwide, full stop. And it's for a few reasons. First of all, they were the first company to design and patent the technology here in the United States, dating back to 1958. Thermosol, a U.S.-based manufacturer based in Round Rock, Texas, employs an engineering team that designs, tests, and continuously refines the product. Their quality control team tests every single steam generator before it departs the factory. Who else does that? Nobody that I know of. I have the pleasure of working with some world-class designers and architects who tell me, and if you're in the business, you know this, that the idea of luxury has changed, especially when clients want a spa-like bathroom. Steam is mandatory or it's just not considered a, a luxury. And if you want to add steam, you have only one true option, my opinion, and that's Thermosol. Mitch Altman, third generation CEO of this family owned company of 65 years, continues to innovate in the bathroom and shower space through technological marvels, such as intelligent showering systems, sound therapy, aromatherapy, technical interfaces, and so much more. And now Thermosol, the industry leader in steam bath equipment and technology since 1958, as I mentioned, is enhancing its already stellar family of products with the new indoor and outdoor luxury saunas. Available in three designs, the configurations are absolutely amazing, and you should probably go check them out. 
indoor and outdoor options. It's amazing. You really do need to check them out. Uh, go to thermosol.com or at thermosol on the socials. So I definitely wanted to capture the moment and I didn't want to miss that where I have so many, I have so many questions for you. You know, you and I met once at a, at a party in Santa Monica and yes. it was, it wasn't the kind of thing where I could be like, so where are you from? And when'd you move here? And would you, but now I can. So yeah, I love we're, that. We're talking about, you know, you're, you're a Midwesterner who lived in New York, moves out to Southern California. And I'm just curious, you know, you're, I always feel like <clears throat> New Yorkers come to LA and the first thing they try to do is change it. Like Angelinos, we talk too slow. We drive too fast. We're, I mean, what's it like for you? And That's what such that a good analogy. <laughs> I think because they're both iconic, big, huge cities that book in the middle of the country and you think they're both going to be the same and they're absolutely not. They're totally different. And you have to learn to accept both. Um, and I think it's taken me a long time to accept LA, a long time. Next year will be 20 years. And um, I, it has gone through so many incarnations. I think LA, if you can make it the city you want it to be, and especially find the group of people, again, like I said, I love the native Angelinos. You people seem to be just good people. Um, if you can make it the city that it, it, it can, you know, I look where I am right now. Can you see out the window? I mean, it's gorgeous. Can you oh, see that? Beautiful. Yep. Yeah. And there's the over there. I'm at a friend's place, but it's a beautiful view. Um, and where can you, where can you get that? You know what I mean? And I, and when I first moved here, everyone talked about the weather and I thought that was such a, oh, this is a funny story, such a bogus answer because they would, when we were New Yorkers, I'm a 9-11 New Yorker. What do you love about New York? I love the people. I love the urine. I love the, the dirt. I love the thick. And then I would go to LA and I was my question, oh, so what do you love about LA when I moved here? And they were like, uh, the weather. And you know what? I have decided that that's the right answer. <laughs> After all these years of sort of being like the weather, that's not even a thing. This isn't even a what. It is. It, it ma makes me more creative. It makes me happier. It brings me more joy, which includes, it helps in creativity. I just, there are many things to love. We get, we have bad PR in the city. So it's funny you mentioned that because it's, it's interesting. And by the way, <clears throat> all of this is going to come full circle to creativity and design and restrained drama, um, <laughs> which, which I love. And I kind of get it, but I, but I want your take on that. But, you know, that's kind of the thing is I, I was reading a story about uh, Europeans who don't really understand America, because the, this, the country's so big and they think, oh, it's like Europe, like France is France and, and Spain is Spain, but it's really not. You know, the U.S. is made of, of 48, 50 states that are all unique within the cities themselves. And those cities are unique within the neighborhoods and communities themselves. L.A. alone is not a city. L.A. is a is a conglomerate of 43, 41 boroughs. That and I didn't old. know that at all. I had no idea of that. It took me a decade to figure that out. And from a creative standpoint, you know, if I were lacking in creativity, trying to put together a show and trying to put together a, a, an episode and, and I can't get anything, you know, I can go down to the beach and look at, look at Catalina, right? Or I can drive downtown and take a walk by the Broad or the, or the Disney or Angel's Flight or, you know, I can, I can go out to the Hollywood Hills. I can go hike Runyon. I can go out to Malibu. I mean, there's it's just like, so It's much. like different micro, you know, San Francisco is micro climates. This is like micro cultures. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So let me ask you something. I have spoken with amazing creatives who came from a legal career, an accounting career, Mm -hmm. um, one who is an agent at CAA. Wow. Talk to me about stepping off stage and into design, because I think I'm fascinated by it. I want I wanted, I wanted you to tell me about the journey, because it's amazing. As a, as a performer, you have a role which has narrow confines. As a designer, you have some confines, but then you've got a wide open berth to kind yes. of add your, add your own creativity. Tell me about your journey. Yes, that's such a great question. Um, I always did both. This wasn't something that happened to me at 30. Um, 
I have been an Actors' Equity in SAG for 45 years, and I'm 49. So you can see that I've been doing this professionally since I was a kid. My mom did it professionally. It was the family business. You were either a doctor, like my dad and my sister, or you were a singer on Broadway, like my mom and I. Um, so it was work in the beginning and just what I knew. And I'm a pretty good singer. I I'm insecure about a million things, but I'm a pretty damn good singer. Um, and that was always sort of a lucky thing that always followed me. However, I grew up with a mother who was in Architectural Digest in the 80s for being garage sale chic because wow. she knew how to shop the properties in Chicago. My mom and I are the opposite. I can find the most expensive thing in the room. She can find the cheapest thing in the room. Always been the, the case. Um, but she does a very good taste. We lived down the street from Holly Hunt. Um, and Holly has been a massive inspiration for me, both personally, more professionally, but I certainly know her. Um, but we used to pick up her stuff that she'd throw out every quarter. So my mom would call me and say, you know, bring my comb because we're going to get the station wagon. She threw out a console table um, and we'd scramble and pick it up. And uh, so that whole I always associated her name with elegance. And so it was from birth, it was from six, seven, eight years old. I always knew that as well. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll speed this up. Um, going to um, New York. So I went to Ann Arbor for a college, which was a really great musical theater conservatory. I always knew at the end of the day that I would be on at Broadway as a singer, even when I was a child. And um, I was there by 21 in Les Mis, uh, which was very lucky. And then I worked with some incredible Broadway stars in shows like Ragtime, The Lion King, La Boheme, uh, Phantom, Les Mis. The, my favorite was Ragtime, which we had Audra McDonald and Brian Stokes Mitchells. Those, that name might not mean anything to the rest of the world, but to our people, they were the, the king and queen, still are. And um, Patti Lapone, Julie Andrews, they would ask me to go to flea markets with them on the weekend because I was the kid in the chorus who liked to go to flea markets and had the eye for it. Um, so I'm sort of doing it 21 professionally, but I wasn't making any money for it. But I got to say that I went with Julie Andrews to the flea markets. No one can say that. Um, and that was always part of my life. My, I was much more interested in calling out of the shows and redesigning my own place in the West Village on 12th Street. And I would have my friends, because I was terrible. I'm Jewish. I was terrible at like the actual doing of things. It was all in my head and I couldn't do it with my, I'm not handy. I wish I was. I don't draw. I don't. I wish I did. Um, we all have our skills, right? Um, but I would employ these people for free or for pizza and beer um, who ended up becoming, I don't know if you know the actor Patrick Wilson, who is uh, now a famous movie star. He was my painter. Um, you know, I had a bunch of different friends who on the weekends we would need different creative outlets and they would be designing the apartment in um, the different apartments because I, I had such a passion for that. Um, but my career was that until I was uh, 31 and I came here to do a show called Ugly Betty. And then there was a writer's strike in 2008. And that's when everything changed to interior design. So... When did you make, okay, when did you make the decision? When you attain success at something and the circumstances around that something change, one has to make a conscious decision to fight through or uncouple from it and go in a different direction and pivot. When I remember Ugly Betty, when did, when did you make the decision and do you remember the process that you went through that is an exquisite question no one has layered that so beautifully um not until years into the career um it was my waiting tables job even though i was extremely successful right out of the gate for luck really you know you hear about luck i had luck um my first job was published for vogue and time magazine and i got all her press went to me and suddenly celebrities were calling me and I was like, hold on, I have an audition for Transformers number three. Um, you know, so it wasn't until three or four years into my career when I started to get published in things. And again, it still seemed like my waiting tables job until I became a big Will and Grace sort of TV star or whatever. And um, my friend said to me, you know, maybe this is your thing. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm waiting for my Tony Award. And they were like, well, this maybe is your Tony Award. And I remember the conversation with my friends and I thought, my first thought was like, designing for entitled rich people is my Tony, that doesn't feel like, but 
it was. It, there's such a wonderful creative aspect to it, incredible collaborations and the relationships that I have with my clients are extremely special. So I think what I, it was a few years in to answer your question. I'm sorry to be so long-winded. You're not long-winded at all. I, um, I, I, I find, and I get a lot of feedback um, from people who listen to the show uh, you know, regulars who, who listen all the time that I get a lot, of, a lot of joy. And I, I think from the feedback that they do too, that there is no such thing as long winded. Uh, I can be long winded, but you not so much because, you know, there's not a lot of time to really just stop down and talk about these stories. And I, and I think the journey really is, it's the experience and the journey itself is so important. And it's so interesting to listen to, you know, Adam, there are, there are people out there right now, there are designers out there who, when this airs, they're going to be listening to this, who are in that same position at every different level. You have those who have, who have achieved incredible success, those who are just starting out, who have no idea how to, how to get new clients, how to make this business work. There are clients who don't know how to find the right designer for them. But what's interesting about someone like you is, and, I, and your story and why I love it so much, is there is there is a certain bravery that comes from saying, you know what, I am going to stop doing this and I'm going to go do that. Making, flipping the switch and making that decision is, is huge. It's transformational. It's scary. It's nauseating at times, but it's, it's terrifying. I think I don't know that I've made it yet. You know really? what I mean? Of, of course I've made it is the answer, but I don't let myself think that it's like uh, alcoholic anonymous is one day at a time. Right. Um, I, I did go back to Broadway to do a show last March, believe it or not, um, which was bizarre. I hadn't been there in 25 years, but I do feel like singing is still like breathing to me. Um, but of course I've made the choice, but what I'm saying is I don't think of it that way. There's always a chance someone's going to call me back to do something and I'll have to open up the New York Adam Hunter office and, sing at night and do this during the day. <laughs> okay. And I, and I would say that would be an issue if you hadn't already succeeded and exceeded at, at what you're doing now. Thank and you. that's kind of the transition. And by the way, I can't help it, but I've got this sort of this vision in the back of my mind, like Neil Patrick Harris is one of your clients. Is he? Isn't, mm -hmm. and, yes. And yes. I've, I've just got this vision of you and, and him during a reveal, both walking through the house and singing your way. There's a video of it. Seriously? I can't believe you just said that. It was two different times. There was the reveal when we were excited and like, oh my God, look at the wallpaper, you know, and stuff like that. But there was also a show we did together around my birthday where we did duets in my mother's living room for friends. And, um, but yes, there was that wonderful dynamic. I do love working with the creatives. Christina Hendricks has great taste. Travis Barker has really good taste. He now is in the Kardashian realm of design which is a different sect um but i was with them for a long time and i do think there's something great about the creatives um not as fruitful to your business <laughs> not as not don't help as much as paying your overhead um as some of the people and also you get to be more uh creative with higher budgets which i hate but it's a part of the truth and um, those are usually the finance people and stuff like that. But no, I love that. I feel like there is a crossover. They have tried to make a show for me for years called Musical Makeover that I have uh, turned down until they did talk about bringing Ryan Murphy into it, who did Glee. And I was like, okay, now I'm interested. And it was actually the people who did Extreme Makeover Home Edition. So it was, they were trying to merge those two shows, which I thought was very interesting. Still talked about it, I don't know if it'll happen, but um, yeah. It comes out of both, it comes out of the same place of your brain, right? Even if you're a lawyer, which I respect so much, and then you're a designer, Sandy Gallen, what a genius. Um, I think he was a manager. I'm not quite sure. Someone's going to know this better than me who's listening to the podcast. Um, but he made the Palisade Malibu homes of the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, the Black Forest, the White Wayne Scott, bringing back that Hamptons looked was which was so prevalent then sort of how I started um so it comes from the same place there's magic to be found there but I didn't admit it for a long time I wouldn't tell designers about it I had a lot of shame around it some very well-known designers were not kind to me I wish I could name his name um but 
and I have to many people, but I'm not in here, but he would call me jazz hands or something or Adam the actor. Um, and by the way, he was a professional model before this. So I wanted to be like, can't we just say that you're the model? Um, but I, I, I think the success happened very quickly and some people didn't love that in the community. Now it's not like that at all. Um, but that happened and I felt shameful of the two. Um, as in Kelly Wurstler is not, not going to be a visual artist as well or a jeweler she's she's what she is however years later i think wouldn't it be cool if she was a visual artist and a jeweler because i would be interested in that so like there is a way that the two forms can live together someone who's a lawyer turned interior designer has incredible business acumen that i don't have what a, what a, what, a, what a skill you know what's really interesting adam is um you mentioned you invoked the name of kelly Wurstler and um I have, I've, I've never met her. I have tremendous admiration for her for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is in a prior life for me, um, I came from broadcast. Um, mm. I was the general manager and program director of Playboy Radio. So I worked for Playboy Enterprises and I managed the radio division. That's so cool. And Kelly was a playmate. Yes, she was. I and love that would, about her. And yep. What's interesting is that I get the feeling um, that she doesn't she doesn't really lean into it and she doesn't really talk about it much forward facing. And I get it. I, I do understand that because there's there's kind of there will always be the people who judge you for whatever reason. I mean, it, people don't need a reason to judge anyone. And oh. the, and the advent of social media, people don't need a reason to, to spew hateful shit sometimes either. Um, they just, awful. And by the way, we're in a position of judging. Design is judgy. Fashion design is judgy. That's what we is. do. I don't like that part of it. But. Yeah, no, it is. But the thing about Kelly is what I learned when I was working um, for Playboy is that those Playboy Playmates and those Playboy models work harder than anybody yeah. I know. Yeah. And if you think about it, especially the, the Playmates, like you have your, your day in the sun. You get 30 days. You're Miss May. You get May because yeah. there was already an April, which you replaced. And there's going to be a June, which is, you know, who's going to replace you. You right. have to figure out. I mean, imagine if somebody said to you, hey, listen, you're going to be the top designer in the country, in the world for one month. But yeah. then after that, it's going to be somebody else. Go do you. Yeah, I, mean, I never yeah. thought of that. We don't I never thought of that. We don't ever have to take advantage of making hay while the sun is shining in such a small window of time. However, I so I take that example, you know, back to you. It's the same kind of thing. There's always that fear that there's going to be a new designer. There's going to be a new it girl, it man, it, it designer, it style. Um, and there's always this fear of going from um, having imposter syndrome to yes. being to being someone who is replaced by someone else it, that's real that's emotional that's psychological yes it is this is a great show you should do this design psychology because <laughs> no i'm serious there is so much in there and I, this is an interesting thread there's a big difference between designers and actors actors are warm and dramatic and crazy and wonderful and messy and honest and authentic and many different things. And designers keep things very close to their chest. Designers aren't saying, here's my upholsterer, here's my, here's my guy, you go ahead and do it. I do have some friends in the business who are wonderful people who I, you know, the great Annette English and people who are wonderful sources that I share with. Um, and I think it's changed a little now, but it was a, it's a very snobby profession. And by the way, some Clients love me because of my theatricality, which is just built in who I am as a human. And it's a fun person to be in a relationship with for two years, because most of my projects are two to three years. Um, and some don't. They want a snobby bitch. And that's okay. That is okay. They're going to want someone that goes, no, ugh, I would never choose that. This is this one's better. This one. You need this one. It's 60000 and more. But you take it. And they go, oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yes. You know what I mean? So it's like... It's like the different energy has, it, 
is 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 good is okay but i did notice i was very angry at designers my first 10 years and i'll be very honest about that i just kept calling my friends on broadway and saying you guys would not believe how different these bitches are they're so not authentic and warm and guarded and is it la or is it design you know what i mean and maybe it's both uh, i feel that much less and less now i think because of social media and channels like that i think of mindfulness and trust which is you know, we have Trump on one end and those kind of people. And then you have these high roaded Oprah thoughtful people. I hate to put them in that category, but you know what I mean? Um, and I think the world is also becoming more mindful in a great way about things like that. You are listening to my conversation with the incredible Adam Hunter. And we'll be right back right after this. As a busy professional designer, you know how important it is to find the right partnerships. Partnerships that allow you to specify the right products for every project. Professionals like you don't just have time to sit around and waste, right? So let me tell you about one of my partnerships. Pacific Sales is here to serve you with expert, knowledgeable, and non-commissioned professionals to help you specify the right product for all your projects, non-commissioned. That means their only incentive is your satisfaction. Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home, a Best Buy company, has just that, with over 60 years of service in Southern California. Pacific Sales is your destination for exploration, advice, and inspiration. And you will find all your favorite brands, like Monogram, and their commitment to providing exceptional products, starting with materials. Monogram sources commercial-grade stainless steel on their refrigerators, unscratchable sapphire glass on their cooktop knobs, durable marine-grade bearings on their dishwasher racks. Monogram takes inspiration from the leading edge materials used in the high-end automotive and aeronautics industry to provide you with lasting beauty and exceptional quality. The beauty is backed by the same level of attention to performance, which is why monogram appliances are trusted and sought after by chefs all over the country. Chain-driven French oven doors that can be opened with one hand and an industry-exclusive hearth oven that allows for all electric indoor brick oven style cooking without the need for external ventilation. These are just a few of the things that make Monogram so special. Pacific Sales features Monogram appliances, and Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home Team is here to help you and offer their Pro Rewards program, which is a trade program unlike any you have experienced before. And here's the cherry on top, access. Access to exclusive builder trade incentives from top brands like Monogram. Visit a Pacific Sales showroom today to learn how you can unlock additional savings and benefits. Don't miss out on the opportunity to work with the best of the best. Visit Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home today and elevate your projects to new heights. Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home, where excellence meets expertise. Man, I, I love this. I, I have a new sponsor partner on the show that I want to introduce you to if you're not already familiar with them. If you are a specifying designer architect, landscape architect, or savvy design enthusiast, if you have heard about the quiet luxury movement, this idea of crafting a lifestyle around understated elegance, simplicity, and sophistication, there's more to it than that. And I will add uncomplicated living. Isn't that what we all strive for? I'm, I am extremely happy. I'm really thrilled to share a company that embodies all of this utilizing proprietary technology and a focus on sustainability in their stunningly beautiful products. It's TimberTech. TimberTech is the premium decking company delivering multi-tonal color blending and natural wood textures in a product that is virtually indistinguishable from a natural wood product. What does this mean? It means it's everything wood should be, a beautiful look that blends seamlessly with a well-designed space, providing years of enjoyment and performs the way you want it to. No splintering, fading, peeling, cracking, or rotting. I, I had a wood deck uh, at our Manhattan Beach home, and I got to tell you, it was exasperating every year, doing the random board flip, taking out nails resetting them, restaining them. It was a complete pain. It was complicated and I didn't look forward to it. I wish I had TimberTech because TimberTech is not only uncomplicated, it's beautiful. It comes in over 20 finish options and nine collections and 85% of the material is recycled. This is premium decking 
for your next project. Learn more and specify it for your next design project, TimberTech on the socials or TimberTech.com, where you can find a retailer near you as well as a number of tools to create, design, order samples, and get the expert help you may need. TimberTech is uncomplicated luxury and performs. It's your choice for your next deck project. Did you learn, I'm hard pivot. Um, Did you learn, rather, what did you learn through, through your, your history on stage and working with, I have, I have immense respect for art departments and set decorators. Um, I love, love, and I've spoken to so many. I work with the SDSA and I interview their designers, their um, set decorators all the time. I love what they do. They do things, gluing knobs, um, making a set happen, taking a story that was written on a page and creating, manifesting a real world scenario around performers who have to come in and become those people. It would be very, I'm not saying it's impossible by any stretch because the talent of performers is is remarkable, but it would be very challenging to go in just on a black stage or a white room and try to have the same level of inspired performance as opposed to what you get from a set decorator. But set decorators are not designers. As a designer, did did you did you glean any any of what you do from that experience where you're telling a story you're creating the narrative around the around the work absolutely the difference between it being in those rehearsal rooms for 6 weeks and then you sw- switch to the broadway set and you're enveloped and it's such a good example and i've never thought to tell this with my clients of how important your space is energetically you are infused with a completely different level i would say your performance goes up by 25% because you are feeling and seeing and ragtime was an incredible set it won many tony awards it was all beautiful white oak wood planks and it was on a huge rake and it would go up and down and different sets would fly in but they were so elegant and tasteful they were as tasteful as any ad you know spread you might see right now and they elevate you you know they i do think it's so important and yes i was the guy who would just obsessed with them i would follow them around i would talk to them i would say explain this to me show me this um color was so important lighting was extremely important lighting to me and my projects is extremely important i always need a lighting designer i'm good at it but i'm not as good as he is or she is um and i just the importance of that is you know i just think again i don't want to get back to the mindful thing but energetically it's important you i don't think people realize it's, it's almost like feng shui, the next level. How important your space is to how you feel. I, I just, maybe it's just me. I'm aesthetically sensitive, but I feel like everyone is aesthetically sensitive. Well, I, no, I don't think it's, I don't think it's just you. Um, I think you're, I think you're spot on. And what's interesting is one of the things that I absolutely love to do, and we're going to do this in a little bit, is we're going to go through some of your projects and, oh. and, and do a deep dive and explore just some of the, the work that you have on the website. Um, that's obviously that's been published that's out there for folks to see if they go to your website of which there'll be a link um, in the show notes and they can go walk along with us. Cause I have some questions, th- things that I just absolutely love. But we have you- a great one. That's not up there. We have three that aren't up there yet. I have to redo that. But the one which just came out in AD a few weeks ago was especially cool. Just FYI for, okay. for, for you. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to do that next time. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. It's online. It's it's the, the director of Goop. So it's really cool. Oh. We collaborated together. It's a really cool moment. Anyway, go on. Yes. Okay. Well, what I was going to say is, and to your point, I think that the published number is like 1% of the population utilizes the services of designers and architects, right? Which I, I find absolutely tragic. Um, and that's why I do this. I, I love designers, architects. I love what you do. And I think what's so amazing about it is that feel. It's like, to be on a set and a home home design, hospi- it's the same thing like in hospitality design. You know, they're, they're establishing the design around a hotel, a boutique hotel, a, ma- a major hotel, a restaurant. This is all being designed to elicit a feeling. Yes. You know? And you know what's And funny? that's where it's the same as the theater, P.S. That's where it's exactly the same as the theater. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, it's funny. I've been, <laughs> and I don't know if you've experienced this too. I've been to restaurants where the food wasn't great, 
but the design was so good yeah. that the experience was great. Yeah, I agree 100%. 100%. I think that, that it, it's, in, it's incredibly important. It's incredible. It elevates the whole experience. Yeah, it does. And and what what designers do, what you do, is to to craft the environment. You know, through through product materiality, and it's the ideas. It's funny too. You said something about not not being able to draw, and I'm curious. Without being able to draw, I mean, now you have SketchUp. You've got all these all these things that you can do. But how do you how do you express yourself? How do you express your early ideas? without being able to really draw them out? Two ways, a general enthusiasm, like for real. And you can tell if I don't like something, I'm so honest with my clients. Um, it, it just like, even if I fake it, like, yeah, it's good. I can't really take it very well. Um, and um, vernacular words, I'm a grammarian. I came from a, from a musical theater conservatory of a very well-known former English literature professor. And he drilled more about words in our life than singing. And um, I do think it's extremely important to color the journey. There's an example, right? I just showed you a different way of thinking about it. I think words are so powerful. Um, but I don't draw. Thank God there is photo. Uh, I'll just talk the brass text of it. Uh, there, there is photo inspiration. I have incredible people around me uh, who've been with me 11 years who can draw what I think. And that is a magical, incredible, exceptional skill. And of course, there's some genius architects out there who can. Um, sidebar, and this is uh, totally pivoting. I am working on a new company. I just partnered in a new company, which I can't tell you that much about, which is why you have to have me on again, but it is going to disrupt the 1%. Okay. The goal is to bring people together with high design with the design they never thought they'd be able to get because of budget. Um, it does have to do with AI. There's There are many different components to this, but um, it's really exciting because on one end, I think um, designers will be reluctant to be involved and I'll be knocking on Frank Gehry's door and all those people. Um, on the other end, once they see what I've seen about what the how the future is going with interior design, you're going to get on board. You know what I mean? There, there is a huge, we're in the middle of a, of a seismic matrix like change. 100%. It's interesting. Um, so I, I, last year I took a course through MIT on AI and machine learning. And I've been talking about AI for quite some time. I, I do, I, I did a panel in October uh, at West edge design fair about AI and how it's cool. Gonna so I would have loved to have seen it. I will send you the link. I record everything. Please. So I'll send you the link. Here's what's interesting. There's a process, right? There's a, what's going to happen? A lot of it is, is very predictable. What's going to happen? Um, you can go back and look at a lot of designers and look at their blogs. Blogs. They started a blog back in 2010, 2013. And then you can see on their website where it stopped 2016. They just didn't publish them anymore. Very good analogy. Then all of a sudden, starting in 2021, 2022, you've got all these blog posts now. And you can tell that they're AI generated because they're, um, there are no spelling errors. Oh, there, I didn't know that. I didn't there know. There are no grammar okay. errors, but there are gross factual errors all over the place. They make no sense. They repeat every, every point, like three, you know, you, when you read those articles on all the, on all the websites where they tell you that they tell you, then they tell you what they told you. And then they tell you what they told you that they told you. It's kind of like that where they just repeat everything and combine that with um, the, the fall of Laurel and Wolf. I think it had, a, it had a, many, oh, yes. I think it had many in the design community really worried that AI is going to replace the purpose of a designer. And I don't think that's true. I see it differently. I see it will open a door to the rest of the country. And I'm talking about, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about people at the, at the who shop Wayfair, but I'm also talking about really that restoration hardware um, demographic of people. Restoration hardware is beautiful. It's nice. I buy it. I also hate it. You know what I mean? It's, we, we all are very torn about it, but you're at the end of the day, you're getting a beautiful home. That's a catalog and design is in the mix. 
and I'm laying way too many Easter eggs of where we're going with this. But uh, I don't think there's been anything on a really elevated level, which is going to involve bringing on vendors at a really elevated level and sort of changing the game, changing the resale license idea. Um, designers can make money different ways, though. Their their designers make money on clicks, and they make might make mailbox money, which is what the rich people call it, and. Because being in a service industry is hard. Many of my billionaire entrepreneurs say to me, you're a good guy, get out of service. I don't care how creative you are, get out of service. And I was like, I'm not you, dude. I can't even, I can't do finances. I'm not you. And they're like, figure it, figure it out. Um, so for many reasons, also I am, I don't know. Career number three sounds like it's 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 coming together in some way, but I think it will be the fusion of everything. But I do think that AI is fascinating, and I'd love to talk more about it with you, even offline. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, and I, and I've got some things to share, but I I think it's really interesting. Like I can envision a, an environment where a a designer can can take a, an onboarding form and a, and an input doc and say, okay, feed a model that says this client likes this, they like that. Maybe they've they've got a, an Ethan Allen piece. Maybe they've liked an RH piece that they have in their right. home, but they also like something from Ikea. Many people do. Um, right. and, and then, you know, and then the Roche Babois Mahjong classic, they love Correct. that. Too. It's like, okay, so now you're going to feed that model. The model is then going to calculate and turn around. It's like, if they like that, then they are by percentages most likely to like these things and then Correct. but then does that give you as a designer the opportunity to then do the magic that you do adam and turn that into a well-crafted well-curated well-edited design yes and i will tell you exactly how when we're not online because i'm i'm, I'm <laughs> too I'm, not under, I'm under ndas um but but i'm excited to say yes however the one percent of this is never going away being an interior designer is being a full-time psychiatrist. Um, it is being a full-time handholder. It is meeting clients where they need, where they are. They're paying big fees. You are their person. Um, and project management's going nowhere. High-end construction, boutique hotels, that will be the same in 100 years. You're still going to have, although I do think people, staffs, architects, and interior designers will be able to lower their overhead with um, AI robotic sort of software people. And uh, I, I know this for a fact because I know firms in LA who are already doing it. One of the things that I that I love about you, and I want to get to your work specifically. Yes, the yes, work yes, thank work. you. Thank no, you. no, no, yeah. no, in a minute. The, but one of the things I, I really love about you that I wanted to to talk to you about, and you've kind of you've kind of opened that door or cracked it a bit with with this new company that we can't talk about, but we will in the future. I, I want to talk about your products and partnerships, because this is one thing that I think eludes many creatives. They just don't know how to put it together. And I think sometimes because they don't, many don't know how to put it together, they'll just kind of take whatever comes and put it all together. It's, it's totally lacking the, the fine curation and the edit. But with you... So it's really interesting, you know, when I when I look at your partnerships with like the rug company and I and I look at Fromental, uh, which is is it coming or is it out? It's out, but there's a new incarnation of it that we're, we're doing an Aur Aurora Borealis version, but it was all inspired by this The Night Sky. Love it. And, you know, your, your stand and tray and the furniture and the outdoor, you have curated a, a group of partners, which it's extraordinary to me because what I think it does is it's it's this brand extension to Adam yeah. Hunter and what you do, but it it per, it falls perfectly in line with the work that you do and the feel that you emote. Where does that come from? Is that a is that a team thing? Is that is that a you thing? Where does that come from? Oh, such a great question too. It's instinctive, really. Then it becomes more strategic, and then you bring on the higher you go in your career. Uh, not higher, that's the wrong word, but you get to a point where you do want to bring on people with the right relationships who will introduce you. But I moved to Los Angeles and while I was still very much an actor, I was obsessed with the rug company because I had never seen fashion. Oh, by the way, for me, and I think for many interior designers, I see a woman's bag or a high heel and that's a room in my head within seconds. I could look at a saddle handbag and turn it into a tobacco lounge in, in moments. Um, 
so fashion, 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 Alexander McQueen, you know, uh, Saint Laurent, Dior, those, those are the, the people who do it for me. Um, and, and the rug company brilliantly, uh, Chris Sharp, many, many years ago, brought in his fashion friends to do these rug lines. So it was Alexander McQueen and von Furstenberg and Paul Smith and all these people. So that made me as starry eyed as being on Broadway. I had to do it. I had to do it. And then when Dame Kelly Wurstler did it, and I'm very, very, uh, open and honest, I've told her many times personally, that she was a huge in influence um, in talk about partnerships and breaking the, being a disruptor in her in her strategic ways of planning people. Uh, I had to be there. And um, I just made that happen. I think I was a huge fan of the brand. I would place the brand uh, and then I had some really good ideas and they listened. Um, and then from there, you just meet people that you connect with. Tim Butcher, who is the head of Fromital is, an exquisite man, um, a lovely human, and has also brought on uh, Tahuli and, and great, wonderful brands to, to work with. Um, you know, one of the things that is in this next for, foray for me is luxury technology. So that's where Stand came about. We were the first high-end piece luxury accessory before there was even a company called is it Native Union? I forget what it's called. There's, there's, a, there's a company that now specializes in this. But we had, we had the Kardashians bought them. I mean, all the right people bought them. And this was in 2013. This was 11 years ago. But what I learned is, was, this is a lesson learned the hard way. It's a technology company, not a luxury materiality company. Because the, think of how many iter iterations of the iPhone we've had that would no longer fit in the molded block of marble. Um, However, there are other ways to do that economically, but I've always seen um, te technological things being more artful than people use them as. Um, I think that's because I was always obsessed with Apple. Um, the, but to say that, yeah, good partnerships. I've been very, very lucky. I love my red line. I have a new one coming out next year. And it will be just in time for when we circle back and do this again, which I love. Yes, that would that be would great do. timing. Um, restrained drama. Yes, it Tell was me. a word. It was a word that Michael Coors used on uh, Project Runway. I don't know, fifteen years ago, and it was this designer who had very architectural dresses that took my breath away. And he said, "You know, restrain drama." And I was like, "That's what I want to do because I think drama is part of it." I use words like drama and glamorous and theatricality. Uh, in different ways. Martin Lawrence Bullard, wonderful designer, also uses the, those same words. He uses them in bigger ways, more literal, fanciful ways. I like to restrain that. My shrink always says that um, my designs are so quiet for such a loud mouth. You know what I mean? Um, and that Said with real, love. That, that, my real, that my real self comes out through my interiors because I like to give the big idea, whether it be in scale, in in, in quality, in a big glass lit structure. Um, but there's a way they can do it that seems super, I guess the word is elegant and refined. Those are all the same kind of words, but more than anything, it's warmth. You have to make these things warm. And that's a, big, that's a bit of a challenge when you're dealing with aspirational, luxurious, glamorous places. You have to keep them that it's still someone's home and they feel good in it. So I love I love that too, and I think I think it's great. You you mentioned Martin, who who too comes from the stage, mm -hmm. which which I think is is a, a yes. similarity that you two have in common, which is really interesting. Um, but I just thought it was interesting because you are so you are so purposeful, um, and and because words are words do matter, you know, and words are so important. And I think that's one of the things too. Like as a performer you can't just go up and start adding words to a script. You can't just start adding right. words to a song because nope. it will shatter, it will shatter the, the structure. And that's one of the things that I find. So, you know, the arts and the edit, right. And that's one of the things that I think with your words, with your work, when I, when I saw those words put together, I was like, yeah, yeah, I really, I, I get that. Um, and that's why, so thank you for the, for the origin story, because when I look at, uh, for example, Brentwood Park 2, which you're calling House of Blues? Yes. Yes. I, I mean, what's not to love, but what's, what's so fascinating and so fantastic about the work is 
in this particular home, which which is of uh, traditional architecture. Yes. Ken, it, Ken Unger was the architect, a great LA architect. Uh -huh. It did not, um, who is the architect? Do you know who? Do you know offhand who the architect was on this? Yes, Ken Unger. Sorry, who's, okay. a, who's a very well respected uh, West Side Los Angeles architect. I, I love it. What you've done with it. This is so. It's so well curated, and I, I know I keep coming back to that, but it's so comfortable. It's thank you. It is, it's an it enormous is. house, so being comfortable and warm is a thank you. That's a real big thrill. I think it's thirteen or fourteen thousand square feet. So. To and, and the, it's called House of Blues because the, I couldn't get the client to see any color other than blue. They could only see blue, which most people is most people's go to color because it's the sky, of course. But what we did is we used blue in a rainbow of blues. We used blue in ombre, we used it in the stairs, we used it in pixels and patterns and threads and gradients. Um, so I hope that effect is yeah clear. One of my favorite rooms from that one is my smoke rug in his. Uh, study, mm. um, which was also traditional architecture. It was a very black, dark room, and we painted it a pretty smoke embers, gray, light gray. And uh, it just feels good in there. There's an original Eames chair, and then there's a contemporary desk from Ryan Jackson, who's a great designer, and um, a great focus, a great, you know, the rug company uses that photo all the time, which is lovely for my rug. Yeah, and I and I recognize that, and I love that. And, and what's what's interesting about an office is like, you know, a workspace. And someone who, so look, I came up from broadcast and broadcast radio. Um, every workspace in a at a radio station is decade old cubicles, mix match chairs, um, nothing that makes any sense. Yes, matte it's black wires. Sucking. Soul, soul sucking. sucking, soul sucking, exactly. And the opposite the, of creativity. How are you supposed to be creative? It is so true. It's exact, and that's why this this particular office, with that stunning fireplace juxtaposed against that rug, it's. I mean, the the visual is is really quite striking. Thank you, thank you. I love it. I love it, and I love what you've done with the color, and and it's interesting too because there is a great deal of blue. You look in the you look in the living room, and it's it's beautifully done. And then you get to the dining room, with those oxblood chairs. Yes, and, that's the color name. Yeah, and the white space and the chandelier. It's just it's dramatic, and it's I mean it's just absolutely exquisite. It's it's okay. If I had to put a visual to restrain drama. Mm -hmm. that's the one I would use. Oh, that's a wonderful way to say. It. Yes, because it, was, it wasn't overcrowded. It was, minimally, it was minimally spaced. There's an etherealness to the Fromental wallpaper. Um, and then the chairs are the drama. That's the Game of Thrones moment. I went yeah. through a huge Game of Thrones moment with reds and oranges, and I was obsessed with that show and my textiles. So talk to me about, I, I, I want to actually transition to kitchens for a second. Mm -hmm. because... My favorite thing, probably my favorite to do. Is it really? Yeah. Why? Actually, kitchen and dude offices. I really love those. I really okay. love those. I'm hired a lot for media rooms, um, which is great too, but I love kitchens. Anyway, go on. Well, why? Why do you enjoy kitchens as much as you it, do? It's funny. I wish I could say for some soulful, deep reason, like because I cook and I have children and I know what it's like to gather around the stove and have the heart of the home. It's none of that. Um, I, I do think, of course, it is the central part of the home, but I think it's a time, it's a moment that one can be dramatic. Uh, I have a project, a kitchen that I love. My favorite kitchen we ever did is under Nashville, which is on our website if anyone wants to look. Um, and it's still warm and cool, but it's very dramatic with bronze cabinets and uh, Calicutta Viola stone. And uh, I work a lot with Amunil. One of my best friends owns a wonderful company called Amunil, which is all luxury metal. And he collaborated on that with me. But I think the kitchen is just an extraordinary moment. And you spend most of your time there. And I think you can be brave. I don't understand white kitchens. They don't make sense to me. The thing with kitchens, too, is... I can't think of a space in the home that has taken on more dramatic change than the kitchen. I, and I mean, holy right. moly, look, main kitchen, 
dirty kitchen, working kitchen, scullery, yeah. pantry, wine bar, uh, coffee bar, um, wet bar, yeah. weed yep. bar. Yep. Kitchen. Oh, I love that one. Love that one. Yep. But I, but I asked the question too, because that's one of those spaces that is just so complicated visually and because form and function are both equally important in that space. Now you talk about your, your media rooms, what I think most people don't really realize, and this is coming from my background in broadcast and studio design, you know, I would say, and you could probably confirm this, that more, there is more in a, in a media room that you do not see than what oh, you yeah. do. Yes. I love that. And I love the challenge of hiding that. We work with incredible people. So I never deal with, of course, anything audio visual, but um, I was really tired of dentist fabric, which is what they put over speakers. And you have the choice between brown, brown and dark brown. Um, and what we did again for our Nashville media room, another one that I'm really proud of was we did perforated wood paneling. And I found the exact measurement of the holes to cover um, so you don't see any of the material behind it. So it almost looks like a, a modern wainscot throughout the room, um, but everything's hidden. And I just thought that was a cool technique. And again, that's the creativity that working in this field allows you to do, especially with people of, who trust you. What did and you... they're rich, but trust you. <laughs> what, did you, what, did you what is that ceiling? In Nashville, oh, in the that media was room. incredible! My God, that was a massive ceiling. It's like a quarter of a million dollars. It was um, Roberts Audio Video. I'll give them a shout out. They're brilliant. They do most of the media rooms in Southern Los Angeles. Um, and I wish I could describe it better. It's some optical amazing thing that actually does form constellations, and it's never the same twice. It's always something new in the universe. That's, Adam, that's amazing. This, this media room, and by the way, if you go to um, the show notes, I'll have a link to adamhunter.com. You can look on the, on the projects and go to Nashville. Look at this media room. It is just. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty magical. That whole this, house I love. This whole house, what a project. I, yeah. Okay, so let me ask you something. And by the way, one of the things that I find so extraordinary uh, about your Nashville project is you go from room to room to room. There was, there doesn't seem like there was any, there's no matchy matchy. Uh, you, you seem to have get, been given carte blanche and freedom to I go did. in I directions. Does. I was, and he loved color. He wanted color everywhere. Um, and he wanted luxury everywhere. This is a guy, one of his many homes is at the top of the Ritz Carlton building downtown. Um, and, but this project was special because it was 400 acres in Leapers Fork, Nash Tennessee which is, um, and I did it collaborated with Steve Gianetti, who's a wonderful architect who I brought on, uh, who ended up moving to Leaper's Fork, which is crazy because uh, he was a huge architect in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, and still, still, still is. Um, but it was amazing to be able to create a whole ecosystem out there. Not only was the house, there is, we, we dynamited four acres to put in a lake that has fresh fish in it now um, and a boat and a zip line an incredible garden and then an incredible herb garden. It's basically, you can shop whole foods there. Um, animals, all kinds of animals, especially little animals, like little horses and stuff. Um, so it was a really magical experience, but the guy was loved Jules Verne. He loved actually what I love too, which is sort of that huge, I've never even been to Disney, which I know is a crazy thing to say, but that Epcot 1960s future look there's actually an architectural word for it and I'm forgetting what the word is. There's a, there is a word for this, that dreamland or I forget what it was like, um, but it was very inspirational. And we were able to use again, the, the finest materials, but use it in a very theatrical way. And he loved color. So you had to make sure the color was cohesive. I didn't want you to go from red to orange, to yellow, to green, to blue. Um, red is not a color I normally use, he, uh, but I was required to. <laughs> okay so let me ask you something too when your client tells you i'm going to need you to design a space around and including the robot from lost in space yeah that's what's what your I mean. first that's what, what's your first reaction 
that I fucking loved, sorry, did I say that? Lost in Space, but I loved it. I was obsessed. I wanted to like date the husband captain dude. Like I, I, I was totally obsessed. Um, so to find that, to get that down, to find the original robot, to have it manufactured, that was super cool. But um, it did lead to a conversation about a Bruce Wayne, Batman, the TV show, Secret Door. So in order to go down those stairs, there is a fabulous, very ornate bookcase that's stacked with things on it. And you push a button and the door opens. And it leads you down to this. Actually, the smoke rug is especially cool here because it was the Mount of the Wizard of Oz. It starts in a neutral colorway. And by the time it turns the corner, it wraps down to that rainbow in color. So that's what I mean about theater, right? That's what, that's what I bring. That's why I'm a little different, right? Um, it, it was just such an important part of my soul. It still is. And when I have clients who especially love that, I have a wonderful client whose work is on there. They're, she's a very, very well-known writer, and she grew up in Manhattan. And her father uh, is Charles Strauss, who wrote the movie, An who wrote Annie and Bye Bye Birdie and many musicals. And she wanted a house that felt like it touched all of New York City and the culture, and the word theater was in there, yeah. So there's ways to make it pretty and not it's, obvious. Just amazing. Okay, now I got to ask you. Um, did you make a point to be on property when they're blowing up for the lake? Oh, yes. Well, I, 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 I God, I missed the actual explosion. We saw, saw lots of pictures of it. Um, but we did walk around and tape out the whole thing. There's a picture of the lake in, in there. Um, um, the, uh, it was incredible. And that lake is a real freaking lake now. It's amazing. You can lie out there. You can fish. It's crazy. It's, it's amazing. And again, going back to that kitchen, I just think that kitchen is, is just exquisite. And here's what I love about it too. I don't know how restrained it is, but it is dramatic. <laughs> oh, it's not, it's not restrained. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. And, and I think this is part of your superpower, Adam. Like if you tried to do restrained in this room, on this property, on this project, it wouldn't look right. Right. Which leads to an extremely unpopular thing to say that I'm going to say. Um, my clients, well, this part is true of all, and many interior designers don't cook. They don't cook. Um, there are people who cook in the dirty kitchens and the things like you said that you know. So the kitchen is a spectacular showpiece. It's a moment to do something like my next one I want to do is reminiscent of the modern part of the Louvre. You know what I mean? Some brilliant glass sculpture. Um, and I think it doesn't, this is the part that's controversial, always need to be the most functional. For example, for someone who is an extreme wonderful chef, I would never use patina light bronze root beer stained cabinets. They're, they're not, they're not going to hold up. And I told the client, I didn't, this is not wool over his eye. I told them. And he made it clear that, you know, they weren't big cooks in general. And when there would be an event, someone would use it. So that's a, a time where you can make an art piece kitchen. And you did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So let me ask you something. How do you, how do you continue to feed the creative side of you? And, and hear, hear me out. Mm -hmm. when, when one attains a certain level of achievement, the projects get bigger the budgets get bigger, usually, right? Yep, um, yep. The, the, opportunity, the stakes get higher. Stakes get higher. And you're walking on that, on that tightrope and, you're, and you're, you're answering to a lot of people about a lot of different things. And one thing I will tell you um, that any designer who's listening who has, um, who has celebrity clients or, or uber rich clients, billionaire clients, knows this to be true. The client's not saying, oh, you want to do that? Usually they're saying, let's just, fine, we'll throw more money at that. Fine, we'll throw more money yeah, at that. Fine. Right. Usually there's a money person behind it. And that yeah. money person is responsible for a budget that has been given to this project. The client will come in and say, you know what? I want this and I want that and I want this. Yes. And then you go back to the money person to say, well, the client wants this. And they say, well, you're going to have to find it somewhere else because we're not adding. Oh, it's funny. I always cut out the money person. Ha <laughs> ha. But you're right. Do you the really? The money person is there. Yeah, well, because I, 
Devil Wears Prada, Meryl Streep says, reach for the stars. You know what I mean? I, I want to show you, you're, you're, this is dream. This is magic. This is theater that we're creating uh, on these $40 million homes. Uh, let's reach for the stars first, and then I'll value engineer it within reason. You know, that, then we'll come down to a regular thing. But when I do come down with our budget that we make and we do share with the money person, I will always show the clients a better option, A and B. That doesn't necessarily mean more expensive. Sometimes the piece will come from Crate and Barrel. I don't know. But I but I uh, want to, sometimes it might be a $60,000 piece of art. Like, you know what I mean? I want to at least, and then they make the choice. And that's when they start in their own marriage or in their own self bartering. I'll get rid of this for this. I'll do this for this. Or if we're lucky enough, yes, just do it. One last question about the art. I'm going to totally, because you mentioned art, I, I, I find that so interesting. It's, you know, art is one of those tricky things. Yes, too. it is. It's really, really tricky. When you, what is your philosophy? What is your approach to art? Is it, you find the artist that you jive with, that you feel like works with the design, or is it a color palette, or is it something that you, you bring the client in at the beginning? We're, because art is one of those things where you could have one piece, like you said, that's $60,000 or more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, they're the blue chip people who come in with their own art gallery. The lighting, the art museum lighting is so incredible. They come with documents and indexes of their art. Don't have many of those. I think I had one. Um, I always say find, I love being a mus musical theater. That was Freudian. Uh, an interior design producer. I've always used that term. Find the right people. My, my friend Adam Kamen's at Amunale. He is better than anyone. You won't find anyone better. Go to his website. It's just the facts. Um, I'm not going to do metal. I'm going to bring him on. So that's the same thing with art curation. Find someone who you align with their with their art, with their point of view. I love art that makes you happy. Um, some people like art that is very treacherous that I wouldn't put in someone's home. Skulls and weapons and guns. Oh, guns. That's a whole thing. Holly Hunt even has a whole beautiful, really sexy gun art in her showroom. Um, I wouldn't do it energetically, but some people would love that. So you find the right person and then you do it in tandem. But in my opinion, lighting is art. Um, Jane Hallworth, who's at Blackman Cruz, does a, does a beautiful, cons it's in that Nashville photo actually, it's a constellation light. Uh, I am drawn to a lot of things, same with my From and Tell wallpaper about the stars and the universe, that's very important and inspiring to me. Um, I think it's $35,000 or something like that. So I'm not going to show, tell, tell my client, we're getting you a light for $30,000. It is 100% a piece of art. Matt Gagnon. Oh, I'll do another great plug. Oh, I'm obsessed with this guy. Um, he does these light totems. They're now in Louis Vuitton all over, but they're brilliant. He uses um, woods and metals and lights. They almost look like beautiful lightsabers as if they were lit up. Um, and they're probably starting, you know, between forty and sixty thousand dollars. They're worth it. They're like twenty feet tall and they're very substantial, but they're art. So I just wanted to expand the definition to be more than things that you hang on your wall. I also think anything Vladimir Kagan. That's a piece of art. You sit on it, but it's art. Um, what what recharges your batteries? Where where do you find where do you find your inspiration? Because, you know, and maybe I'm totally off base on this, but I have generally found that creatives require creative battery recharging of some form, because if you're not, if you can't be creative, you can't really do the job. Um, so what recharges you? Everyone is going to say travel, everyone. And that's yeah. the truth. That's the yeah. truth. Yeah. I had a, a crazy two years and I didn't leave the country um the last couple of years and it was i was starting to feel gray my skin was just you know i felt just so and this year i've i did milan switzerland germany france I, i'm going to saint Barts for my birthday in a week i'm really getting out there so i do think that that's a huge sense of inspiration of course uh, many designers will tell you that there's nothing better than what we're looking at outside. My first rug for the rug company was called Zebois, which is between zebra and faubois wood. Um, and that was very inspired by that. But I also will say, I love some, some of the modern 
things we're able to have. Um, I have found inspiration on in Instagram through visual imagery. I'm not as into the AI rendered stuff. I want stuff that, that's real, but there have been that. You do see a good piece of theater. It's very, that's a big one for me. Um, the Met Gala Awards. I think I watched it 60 times and took notes and made them all into rooms. Um, so that's some of that. Really? Yeah. Would you, would you ever want to design? I mean, I know you don't do fashion. Yes, but... I would. <laughs> uh, I don't know how that translates yet. Um, one of the things I like to work on is sort of an organic, not organic, that's the wrong word, energetic textile line where you feel good in it. You see them in polar bear chairs and you see them in teddy bear chairs, but like, what would that look like as a whole accessory line? And I don't just mean fur. I mean, things that do something to you when you touch and feel them. Um, and that sort of goes its way into fashion a little bit. Um, my new venture, which I will tell you about, I'm going to Tom Ford and a couple of people who are heroes of mine, fashion designers, to, to encourage them to join this enterprise. Um, and so, yeah, I do always love, I do always love that. You know, you said one thing earlier that I just wanted to jump back to. You said about young designers or even very successful designers that I'm, I'm grateful are listening. Um, I have a phrase that's on, in neon on my wall um, from the beginning, and um, it's still on the neon on my wall in a different office. It's on my website. It's now a very common phrase, but I saw a tattoo 16 years ago that said, trust the process. And that really meant it for me because I was trying to tra transition from one career that I was successful at that I knew was how I identified as a human to a different career that I didn't identify with on many levels. Um, but I wasn't shackled to other people's decisions. When you're an actor, everyone makes the choices around you. You don't have your own voice. As a business person in any business, you get to call the shots. And boy, is that liberating. Um, but trust the process is so huge. In the long run, I think it applied to my personal life. But we're still revealing that. That's sort of the big surprise after our 16 years. Um, but I think it's really important. And I tell all my clients, so tell your clients, trust the process, trust your people. If you don't, you will not get a good result. It's science, it's math. And any designer will tell you that. Um, if you say, here are my keys, which I would say to my favorite Collins when, designer when he was alive was David Collins out of London. He's one of the people who inspired me to become a designer. Um, I would just say, here are the keys. Jean-Louis Daniel, take my keys. See you in two years. Um, and walk into their interpretation of who I am. That's a magical experience. That's the way we're, everything is such a high vibration. Um, but I get it. Everybody, they're spending millions of dollars and they have to wait. This is a challenge. I, I also tell, I'm, I'm, the shrink part of me tells them, I know you're spending millions of dollars and you don't see it. You're not walking away with your car that day when you're all on the high from spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and you have it. You have to wait and trust me. And by the way, you get mad at me throughout the way when things don't go right or things that aren't even my fault get transferred to me. Um, they know that, but if you trust the process... And even if you do have your own taste and you want to uh, collaborate, my client that I just said was recently in AD Online, uh, Nora Brown is in his wonderful taste and not my taste. It, her taste is Paris Grandma, self-described. Um, uh, sort of Soho House, if it were even more Paris Grandma. Um, and she wanted restrained drama to have a baby. And we did, and we did. It's a really storybook cool, theatrical but very unme looking place and that's where the magic is but she trusted me at the end of the day she trusted the process anyway i don't mean to hammer it in but i've told it to people and they've written me and come back to me later saying that was very profound simple and profound i love that and um simple and profound is is what i've kind of left this conversation adam i cannot thank you enough for taking thank the time. you to do this, I, I have thoroughly, this has lived up to everything that I hoped it would. I loved our oh, chat. Thank you, that's so nice. Design Hardware's newly remodeled showroom is where you will find a gallery style space with a thoughtful display of products purposefully positioned to allow unbridled exploration and discovery. High-end faucets, luxury tile, 
Natural stone, wood floors, and bespoke hardware selections are presented in a holistic manner, strategically arranged to stimulate creativity and transition your vision from the conceptual stage to a fully realized space. Conveniently located, free parking available, stop by to find your inspiration, collect samples, get expert advice, and tackle everything on your shopping list all in one place. Visit them online at designhardware.com or in the real world, 6053 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles. Thank you, Adam. I loved our conversation, and I am so appreciative for you taking the time to share. Thank you to my partner sponsors, Thermosol, Pacific Sales, TimberTech, Monogram, and Design Hardware. These partners are amazing companies, all who have made a concerted effort to support the design community through education, incentives, events, media, and exposure, not to mention a collection of extraordinary products and service to match. Check the show notes for links to each of them so you can see firsthand how they can make your design business thrive and your projects exceed expectations. Thank you for listening, downloading, subscribing, and sharing the show with your friends and colleagues. Thank you for your emails, show, and guest suggestions. Please keep them coming. Convo by Design at Outlook.com and on Instagram at Convo by Design with an X. Until the next episode, be well and take today first. Mm-hmm.